Hiya and welcome back to another Robert Bryan talks about dot 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 and today I'm going to be talking about uh, another huge influence on me and I'm sure many other people and that's Prince. Now I first discovered Prince in 1984 or 85 I think 85. My sister was a huge Michael Jackson fan and would be playing that music in her bedroom. I would be in my bedroom playing Gary Newman and Deep Purple and the Beatles and stuff like that. And then, you know, the two would never meet. Um, and then one day she just played this this track and uh, I remember it sounded like nothing else that was coming from her bedroom, which would have been Duran Duran and, you know, whatever. And some of it I loved, don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, obviously Michael Jackson's got had some great songs, you know, but it just wasn't sitting with me. It just, felt, I don't know, just didn't quite feel right. Then one day, from uh, her bedroom she was playing this track and it was kind of like, to me, it was like Gary Newman meets Deep Purple. And it was like a dum 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 do da gang do da dang dum 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 do da gang and had this really heavy guitar of jung jung jugga ja gang jugga jung jung but it had this drum machine thing which I would already been turned on to Gary Newman so I was into that sort of drum machine sound and there's dum ka dum ka dum ka dum ka and it was like, what is that? And then this voice over the top with this huge guitar outro, which reminded me of like Richie Blackmore or Jimi Hendrix. And like, take me away. And it was, I didn't know, but it was sort of edited down to make a single. So that, that song was obviously Let's Go Crazy, which I was singing very badly there. Um, but I just remember that was amazing. And then she flipped it over and played the other side, which was Take Me With You. Da, 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 da. Dig a dig a dig dig dig, and had this little sort of uh, string line, dig a dig a dig dig dig, which obviously was played on the synth, but it was so hooky, and it was like that's crazy. It, that reminds me a bit of like a Beatles kind of riff, a late sixties Beatles riff or something, you know, Magical Mystery Tour, Sergeant Peppery, White Album Me Time. Anyway, and I was like, who the hell is that? She said, oh, it's Prince and Revolution. You can have the single if you want it. Um, I don't remember if she gave it to me or I stole it. I've still got it, Joe. Sorry, it's around here. It's down there actually, but anyway, that that was just that was the first time, um, and then I would see the videos. I saw When Doves Cry video, and a few others on top of the pops, but it still didn't really get me. So that was a massive impact. But then it kind of came and went. I was leaving school in '86. A lot of things were going on there, and I wasn't really, you know, I'd let the Prince thing disappear for a while. And then I started working on a YTS scheme, if you remember those back in the day. Um, and I was working at a local drum shop in, in Bath called Assembly Music, which I've mentioned before, which had the wonderful Steve Gardner and Nigel and Simon Gardner and Ken Dewar, all those guys working there. And I was like a warehouse boy. Originally, I was working in the shop as a Saturday boy fixing guitars and just doing a bit of learning how to sell stuff. I was so nervous, I never wanted to speak to anyone. <laughs> but anyway, I got there in the end. But they also had another company, which was a distribution company on the side of that, distributing sonal drums and saving cymbals. So I wanted to work on that side of it really. So once I'd done my like tenure in the shop, they said, off you go, you can now go off with Ken and Simon um, and you can work at the warehouse and help distribute the drums and blah, blah, blah. So that's what I used to do and it was great. And I remember Ken, he, he, he's like a big brother and he's still a really good friend of mine and I love him dearly, he's fantastic. Uh, and he's a great percussionist and, and drummer as well. Anyway, and, and um, we were in the van one day driving to the warehouse, which in Bath it was from Widcombe down to the Windsor Bridge. And anyone local would know how far that is, depending on traffic. Maybe 15, 20 minutes, sometimes 10 minutes, if there's no traffic. And he was playing me this, well, he had this tape machine, uh, the, the tape in the car, in the machine, and he was playing it. And I was thinking, this is pretty cool. And sometimes it'd be the psychedelic furs, Mirror Moves, that was cool. And maybe it could be like something like Cameo or, or Wendy and Lisa or who I later found out were in Prince's band. Uh, anyway, this, this this one week, let's say, it could have been longer than that, who knows. He kept playing this one tape and he kept going round and round. And I was thinking, I know that song. That's been on top of the pops. That's Kiss by Prince. And I thought, that's cool. And I asked him, he's like, yeah, 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 it's a new album uh, da, 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 called Parade. And I remember listening to it. And then slowly but surely, like waiting in the traffic, you know, parading in the car as you do with your window down, you know, in the summer, uh, this music was spinning round and it was kind of, 
you know, that with where I was, I was 16, 17, so I was starting to like discover life. Uh, it all of a sudden the two things hit, and it was hip, it was a hip album, hip sounds, kind of sexy, dancey songs, uh, fitting my kind of where I was at the time in my head as I'm growing up. Uh, the drum sounds, now we talked about Pleasure Principle uh, on the Gary Newman talk about session. Um, that thing he had with the and all that business, this was there in spades on the album Parade, which is this one here, which is the album that Ken was playing me in the car, or just playing, not playing me, he was just playing it. And I remember I had to go out and buy it. I just thought this is incredible because it was a combination of um, acoustic snares with the, um, the snares off sometimes, so you get that timbale kind of sound mixed with, I didn't know what at the time, but it turns out it was a Lindrum, and on Lindrum 1, you could detune the claps. On Lindrum 2, you couldn't. We could always move the EEPROM into a different thing, but that's another story for the, the Lindrum session, when we do a talk about Lindrum. Uh, there was that, there was acoustic bass drums sometimes I was hearing, there was sometimes electronic Lindrum bass drums. Oh man, it was just a world of, not only was I listening to the music and thinking, hey, what's he singing? That's a bit, a bit saucy. Um, you know, what's that guitar riff? That's funky. What's that bass riff? What are those horns doing? What are the drums doing? You know, just that, you know, everything's just sounding like... It reminded me a little bit of Magical Mystery Tour from the Beatles. It was kind of that mixed with Sgt Pepper. It was all kind of modern pop for 86, but dressed up in a way that didn't sound like anybody else that was on top of the pops at the time. Nobody sounded like this. And it was just incredible. And Kiss, you know, no bass guitar on that song, just voice, drums, Lindrum, and guitar, you know, and, and keys and stuff. Just, just amazing. Just a bit of a maverick. And of course he did that on When Doves Cry as well and things like that. But, but this album, I, I just studied it and studied it and studied it and studied it and studied it. I love the, the artwork. I love the way the band look. Just really funky. And of course, Dr. Fink, I always like Dr. Fink. I, I really wanted to copy his image, really. You know, I thought the whole thing with the doctor's outfit and the stethoscope, anyone who knows me, you know, I did don that a few times. Uh, I just thought it was cool. And any bootlegs I could get around this time, like I've got over there, Charade, which is that one there, and that's the Kiss 12 inch there, um, I would get hold of because anything he was doing at that time, like the Dream Factory project and stuff, I just, I just couldn't get enough, and I still can't. Hence why uh, I've got this, which is so hard to pick up. Uh, which is the next album I'm going to talk about, the Sign of the Times uh, album. But there's some stuff from '86 on this too, you know, from the Dream Factory project. And you need to be a weightlifter to pick that thing up. Um, so that was the first one. So this and live in '86 the, at Wembley, the bootleg. I've listened to that and think, how's he doing that live? How can the drummer be playing those sounds and? gated snares and all that, because I was 16, 17, I didn't know a lot about the tech at the time. And it was just like, you know, when you discover something for the first time, it just literally blows your mind. And um, I still, that's a, an album that I still go back to in the car now, and I still listen to it and recommend to people to check out, because I just think it sounds great even now. You know, you put the needle on Christopher Tracy's parade at the beginning, the way that starts with that gated snare, and the keyboards around it, it's just incredible. It could be like, if they had electronic instruments in 1967, synths and stuff like they had in 86, they would have been making that music then, you know, out in California, that sort of stuff would have been happening. Um, the, the other album, I mean, I could mention so many Prince albums, if I'm honest, there's loads, but these are the, the, the two that I would say are the ones I go to, uh, but I've got them all. Sign of the Times, a classic. Um, you know, even people that are record, you know, aren't Prince fans, but record collectors will have these two albums because probably Purple Rain as well, um, and maybe the Gold Experience because they're just great, great records. Diamonds and Pearls is another one. See, here I go off again. But this is brilliant too because, I mean, this is brilliant in other ways. Obviously, the drum sounds are still cool and all those things, and the songs are great. But it's the fact that it was just, you know, everything was done by him. Um, you know, and. As I always say, these things aren't a better or best or whatever. It's just my opinions and how these people have affected me. Um, but in my opinion, he was always the the most talented, if not the most popular in the 80s. He was certainly, I think, uh, the most talented and um, 
compared to Michael and Madonna and Bruce Springsteen and Phil Collins and George Michael or whatever, at times he may not have been selling as many records or getting as many number ones, for instance. You know, but critically, I think his records were far above and his live performances were far above any anything that anyone was doing at the time. And of course, this is highly subjective. Um, but I thought what was really interesting was I saw one of one of these BBC Four kind of documentaries on music or or was it on Sky Arts? I don't know. It was on one of them and they were talking about the 80s. So every now and again I tune in because I know it's going to be more about Madonna and Michael Jackson and Prince will still be there obviously because he was massive. But you know, they're the sort of big hitters sort of thing. Um, and this one uh, reviewer from Melody Maker or Enemy, whatever, you know, he, he, he said something really interesting. He said, look, I'm not the biggest Prince fan. He said, but you know, if we're going to put our cards on the table, I see what he did there because he said, if we had a top trumps game, you know, and on top trumps, you list all the things that are the positives and the negatives and, you know, what the strengths of that character or car or whatever it was, top trumps. He said, if you did an 80s pop star pop trumps, he would win. <laughs> because after singer, dancer, songwriter, you know, um, most people are running out. But he would be like drummer, keyboard player, bass player, guitarist, songwriter, singer, backing vocals, producer, engineer you know, dancer, choreographer, da, da, da. the list would just, and songwriter for other people, it would just go on. Now, I know that's not enough to make a non-Prince fan suddenly like him, uh, but, you know, it, it's kind of kind of true uh, that he had all those strengths, and certainly me, as a young musician, seeing somebody who could do all of that, and then, of course, I see the live performance videos where he's doing the splits, and he's, which I know is a James Brown thing, but he made it his own, the same as Michael made the moonwalk is own. He didn't invent that, you know, he made it his own. It was just a massive inspiration to me. The drum sounds, you know, the vocal performance, the sexiness of the music, uh, his stage persona, the way he'd be on guitar one minute, then he'd pop the splits and then he'd be up on the drums, moving Sheila e off the drums or Bobby Z off the drums, getting onto the keyboards, onto the bass. I mean, I've never seen anything like it now, though there's obviously billions of brilliant people since. Um, but no one has ever hit the marks like him, um, I think, personally. Though I love many, many artists, but there's something about Prince. Every now and again, I look at a performance or something, and you just. And I saw him live many times. And you would leave that arena or theatre or stadium, and you'd be just, you know, blown away by how one person <laughs> can get all of that together, the songs, the band, the choreography, the vibe. One minute you're, you're lusting in a song, the next minute you're singing about God, you know, and then you're just partying like it's 1999. Then he might do a jazz thing. I mean, I remember I saw him in 92 and he did um, Night in Tunisia. It was on the Diamonds and Pearls tour. And I was obviously playing jazz at that time. I was 21, 22. I was doing a lot of jazz gigs as well as sort of indie gigs and rock gigs and blues gigs I was doing a lot of jazz work and um, it kicked in and a friend of mine was at Earl's Court with me and he went hey mate he said that that's one of the tunes you play at the pub and I was like yeah and I was thinking you know this arena of 10,000 people or what whatever it holds was all getting down to night in Tunisia <laughs> and they didn't even know you know the tune and it had a fat drum solo in it by Michael B that was just amazing you know over the top of this ostinato of the head you know duh, duh, duh. anyway and he would do Take the A Train and uh, Footprints by Wayne Shorter. And I just love the way he would just throw that into a set along with some singles and his stuff that he does. He would just throw that in there, you know, if he was going for a costume change, the band would be chopping up. Or he'd, he'd be involved in the playing of that tune as well. They also did Now's the Time, Charlie Parker. Um, it was the thing that, for me, being a jazz musician at that time as well, I would buy, you know, Melody Maker and Enemy and there'd be saying Prince is this, he's that, he's a genius, da 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 da, da. Uh, But I would also be buying, you know, um, magazines that focused on jazz music. And in there you'd have Miles Davis and Herbie Hancock saying, this guy, out of all the pop guys, this guy is the one. This He's amazing, you know. And they would want to jam with him. So there's bootlegs at different concerts where they're jamming with Prince. Uh, and also Miles famously uh, had about, I don't know if it was an album's worth of material written by Prince or just a few songs, but anyway, they worked together on an album, which would be great if we saw the light, of, it saw the light of day at some point. That'd be amazing. 
but you know for me as I say it was one of the only artists you could t go to like many different styles of music and then musicians and say talk about stuff and they would say oh yeah no that Prince is cool so a lot of jazzers in Bristol I was gigging with would be like yeah, yeah no Prince is cool I've heard the new album you know it's good or I've seen a performance you know it's great how he uses the horns and because I think he had the respect of blues jazz folk rock um psychedelia he had the, he had the love of all those different styles and classical and he could throw them into what he was doing so like any if we're going to use that word genius you know there's a little bit of originality in there and a lot of the originality comes from the way they can pull things from other places you know lenny kravitz is kind of a new prince now if you like doing a similar thing you know pulling from all those different places and i think where we are now uh, that's so many things have been done. It doesn't mean that we can't create new things, but by the artists like that show us the way. So we could pull from the Beatles, we can pull from James Brown, we can pull from Parliament, you know, and George Clinton and Funkadelic, and we can pull from the Rolling Stones, and we can pull from that, and we can make and hit Hendrix and stuff, and we can make something and throw it all around a bit, and then put it through a conduit, and it comes out sounding like something new. So as I say, he was an artist that really proved that to me you know, many times on the stage and on and on record. Um, and I'm still buying stuff now, as I say, I've just shown you that box set here, uh, the Sign of the Times box set, which is, I think, I don't know, 11 albums or something. And this is 87. Um, and as I say, had some stuff on there from 86 as well. And at one point he was making five albums at the, the same time, some for him and some were for other people and stuff. It's just so prolific. And I've also got this one here, which is the 1999 Deluxe box set as well whoops this has been peeling off mm. oh well but yes uh and you know what can i say you can tell he's he looms large in the legend um and i love what he does you know like anybody not all of it is going to hit the marks some people are only going to like purple rain some people are going to hear parade and you know they're going to freak out and go yeah that's brilliant you know you like i say about everything you need to find your own prints you know you need to spend some time on youtube watching videos live clips especially live clips to see what an amazing performer he was and so on but as i say i'm not here to try and uh, convert you to to be an interprince this is just about what he brought to me and my music and how much i love him and i thank him god rest his soul for everything that he's brought into my life and again i'm making a record at the moment for myself which will eventually be finished and there's princisms in that you know in the drum sound and i don't think you know, I'm ever going to stop loving the sound of an acoustic kick grooving next to an electronic kick grooving. You know, that's one of the things that 80s music made right for me, <laughs> is the, the, that sound from the 60s, 70s, acoustic kits, perfecting that sound through the Glyn Johns miking and disco miking and all these different things to the 80s where things were getting better again. And then someone saying, right, we've got that live drum sound. Now let's put a fat Lynn drum on it and let's see what that sounds like. And it just sounds epic. So as I say, it's, it's, it's everything. It's the image, everything. He was, he was a maverick. He was a brave man. I'm so glad I was around uh, to see him perform and to enjoy his music, but it's there for all of us to enjoy now. So that's why Prince means a lot to me. So please leave your comments down below if you want to leave any about Prince, music, drumming, your thoughts and so on, that would be great. Uh, and I'll be back again soon with another one of these. So take care guys and thanks for watching.